The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered Streaming Live. Uh, 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 Alright, we're gonna do this again. Alright, folks. We're gonna do this again uh, off the top. Today is January 17th, 2022. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. An Arkansas family is suing a county jail after a mentally ill man was arrested, held in solitary confinement, and died of malnutrition and dehydration. 
We discussed the harrowing details of what happened uh, to the man. He couldn't afford $100 bail. Freshman Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett uh, out of Texas will be here to tell us about her first two weeks on the job and what it's like having to be in the minority in Congress like she was in Texas. A San Francisco com City Committee setting reparations proposes a one-time payment of $5 million to each eligible African-American inhabitant of the city. Somalia is in the midst of a humanitarian crisis. Like never before, a member of a Texas nonprofit helping to aid families and children who are dying from starvation will join us. Let us know what we can do to help. Plus, we continue our Fit Live Win, a new you in 2023 segment. We'll be talking with weight loss specialist Dr. Rovinia Brock, uh, also known as Dr. Rowe, she'll be in studio to discuss her book and share small changes we can make for our ultimate he health. And y'all, wait till I show y'all what United Airlines did to my suitcase when I went to Wichita. Made a brother wear the same damn clothes he wore flying there. Man, these airlines, oh, they gonna pay up. Trust me. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the He's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's rolling, Martin. An Arkansas family is suing a county jail after a man was arrested during a mental health crisis. He died of malnutrition and dehydration while in custody. Larry Eugene Price Jr. was arrested in August of 2020 and taken to the Sebastian County Jail. Price suffered from severe mental illness, including schizophrenia. He could not afford the $100 bail and waited a year in prison in solitary confinement. He reportedly ate his own excrement and refused his medication. The photos you are seeing or about to see are quite graphic and may be triggering. At the time of his arrest, he was six foot two inches tall, weighed 185 pounds. When he died a year later in August of 2021, he weighed just 90 pounds. Eugene Price's brother, Rodney Price, is suing Turnkey Health Clinics, LLC, a healthcare corporation providing medical services to people at the jail, a turnkey psychiatrist and nurse, and several other unnamed defendants. The lawsuit claims the jail staff was not equipped to safely manage a patient like Mr. Price on a long-term basis. It did not have sufficient staffing or training to provide him with safe, effective care. My panel, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, former senior advisor for the Environmental Justice EPA, uh, Randy Bryant, diversity and inclusion strategist, speaker, trainer, and writer, Dr. Jason Nichols, senior lecturer, African American Studies Department, University of Maryland College Park. Mustafa, I'll start with you. Um, first of all, this is what we talk about when people talk about ending cash bail. If you have those policies in place, that man is sitting, not sitting in solitary for a whole year. Uh, if that's the case, Sandra Bland is not sitting in jail as well. And so when you have these people who are against that, well, there are people who have no business being in jail a year in solitary confinement because he couldn't make $100 bail. Yeah, we have a broken system in our country, and one that, of course, focuses on black and brown folks and exploits them in so many different ways. You know, the United States uh, Civil Rights Commission uh, shared a report uh, that showed that 60 percent of folks uh, who are dealing with this type of situation cannot afford their bail. And we also know that uh, the, for first-time offenders, it's like between $500 and $2,500 for the bail uh, that people can't even make. So for this brother to be in this situation, 
Um, it's, it's just so egregious that they would allow these types of things to happen for his life to be taken, for there be no processes in place to step in when you see someone losing that type of weight. It sounds like they also didn't have the proper mental uh, so, so sort of situations in place, making sure that the right types of therapy and, therapy and individuals are in place to make sure that he had what he needed. But it all goes back to the fact that folks should not be sitting in jail uh, in these types of situations. Jason. So to me, this this is, you know, especially tragic. One of the things that we need to do, particularly um, with our incarcerated population, is to improve the health care. There's no way you see a man who's six foot two. I'm six foot two, and I weigh about 180 pounds, and I'm a slim guy. Um, if you see a man getting down to that weight, then he needs severe medical treatment. He needs help. And instead, they watched him waste away and lose 100 pounds and die. There's no way you can tell me that the staff saw this man who came in at a particular weight and saw him get down to the point where he can't walk, I'm sure, and, and said, oh, everything's OK, we're going to continue. And I can tell you, my wife works at an HIV clinic, and they had someone who was incarcerated. They usually don't deal with incarcerated people, but one person came in or was, you know, brought in, and then he brought brought back to the to the jail, and they had to call the, the jail staff and tell them that this man had elevated blood pressure, and he needed blood pressure treatment. And they had to argue with the jail staff <coughs> the entire day, trying to get this man life-saving medications for his high blood pressure. So there are some serious changes we need <coughs> to make, not only to our bail yep. system, we all know about Khalif Browder. We all know about <laughs> the situations where people are sitting in jail. We know that there are effective alternatives like uh, ankle monitoring right. and other things you can do if you think that these things are a problem. But the health care, to see a man starve to death, right. this wasn't a heart attack or something acute. This is something that happened over weeks and weeks yeah. and weeks. And to see that and to let it happen, I think, is is a crime. Those people should well, be behind bars. And that's the piece there, Randy. It's not just a civil suit. It really should be criminal charges filed as well. Absolutely should be criminal charges. And really, the entire system, uh, we need to completely revamp, as uh, my brothers have said today, bail... At, Black people are given <laughs> bail and have and ha a bail sentence more than any <laughs> other race, of course, just like the criminal system always, um, you know, takes takes poor care of us. And also when bail is set, our fees are much higher. The bail amount is much higher for yep. black people. So this, you know, this is an issue that we that's we should all consider for our entire race. Uh, it, again, it's really shameful there. So uh, our goal is to have the family on later this week. So we certainly hope that happens. All right, folks, uh, got to go to a break. Uh, coming up next on Roland Martin Unfiltered, more drama for the Biden administration with more, uh, of course, uh, classified documents found in his residence. We'll talk about that. Also, folks, don't forget, uh, follow us in what we do. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Uh, and, of course, uh, you can also join our Bring the Funk fan club. Check in money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037. That's 0196. Cash app, Dallas Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. They look at all bookstores. Download on Audible as well. And folks, we will be in St. Louis uh, this weekend for the first stop of the White Fear Tour. I'll be in conversation at the St. Louis Area uh, Urban League with Michael McMillan and rapper and activist Tef Poe. Uh, it's going to be at 3 p.m. If you want to attend, send us an email. It's free, open to the public. Send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at RolandSMartin.com. And so pass the word. I'll be in St. Louis this Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, in conversation with Michael McMillan and Tef Poe at the St. Louis Area Urban League, 1408 North Kings uh, Highway, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, so look forward to seeing you guys this weekend. I'll be back in a moment.
on the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach. We're talking about the difficulty of being able to acquire wealth for Black Americans. My guest, Emily Flitter, is the author of The White Wall, How Big Finance is Bankrupting Black America. The bad stuff that you feel when you're dealing with the financial services industry is not your fault. It's not your fault and you don't deserve to be treated like this. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal round table is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far-reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, the discovery of additional de classified documents at President Joe Biden's home in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, took center stage during today's White House briefing. Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre fielded reporters' inquiries, including whether Biden was helping look for documents. Um, given these documents have shown up in very personal spaces, we all know that the President uh, you know, loves his Delaware home. It's an extremely personal space for him. Is he physically joining in the search of these things, rummaging around, you know, these boxes in the garage and wherever else, I mean, literally. Are you, are you, are you listening to your, the question that you're asking me? Look, I mean, okay, look, look, in searching for his own documents? look, I'm going to be very consistent here. Uh, I am going to be very clear here, uh, as I have been for the past couple of days, almost a week now, uh, dealing with this. Uh, you know, we are going to any specific questions that you have about this issue. I would refer you to my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office who spent almost an hour taking these questions from all of you, many of your colleagues. I'm going to let you ask that question to the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, and anything else specific to this, I refer you to Department of Justice. I refer you to special uh, counsel. Now, Jean-Pierre said the search of Biden's home in Wilmington was complete. The latest discovery is the third time the White House has disclosed finding classified documents tied to Biden within one week. Biden's attorneys said they discovered six additional pages of classified materials. The documents were found Wednesday, and the initial batch of about 10 classified documents was found on November 2nd at the president's former office at the Penn Biden Center in Washington, D.C. Jason, I want to start with you here because when we talk about these documents here, uh, obviously, Republicans, uh, they have seized on it and they are going crazy about it. <clears throat> but there is a great contrast between these Biden documents and what Trump did. There, there certainly is. And, and I think even though, you know, some people have criticized President Biden for not being uh, forthcoming in, in uh, you know, the discovery, uh, one of the things that we know that he's doing is compliant. Uh, which, of course, we know Donald Trump lied about it, had his lawyers lie about it. Uh, so it's a, a very different situation. It's still embarrassing. I, I still think that this looks bad for the president. Uh, it's the kind of news he doesn't need when he has so many good things to talk about. 
record unemployment and you know the high, lowest unemployment in 53 years and creating 11 million jobs inflation is falling all of these good economic numbers that everyone uh you know was trying to batter him with he's in a good position right now but instead now we we're focusing on these classified documents and even though there's a big enormous gap between what Trump did where he was saying these are my documents um and you know what Biden did, where Biden is complying, it still gives the right all these talking points to say, hey, he did it too, you know, and, and they're going to have all these investigations. We know they're in charge of the House, so they're going to investigate this and not investigate uh, uh, Trump. And it, it really makes for a bad situation. Uh, I hope they get to the bottom of it. I hope as soon as they get to the bottom of it, they bring it out to the press so that everything is transparent. I think the DOJ has handled this in the right way uh, by having the, the special counsel, uh, who, by the way, voted against Joe Biden in 2008, Joe Biden and, and Barack Obama. He, he supported uh, John McCain and gave him money. So you can't say that this is, you know, some sort of home team uh, event going on uh, by, the, by the DOJ. They got the special counsel, the special counsel, uh, is non-political, and if he is, he's to the right. So I think this is a good thing. I don't think anything bad is going to come out of this, but it does give the right a talking point and a false equivalency to put out there, and that's a problem. Uh, it really does screw up the momentum of this White House, uh, Randy. And, and frankly, look, um, <clears throat> Washington, D.C. reporters, they love stuff like this uh, because they can chew on it every single day. And, and, and then the problem is you create a new news story every day. Found one day, news story. Found a second day, news story. Found a third place, news story. And so to me, this is one of those where really the whole deal is search everything. And then frankly, don't do a second and third or fourth. Do one announcement. Say we've looked everywhere. I, when, they, when they found for the second and the third time, I wouldn't have said Jack. I, I would have done a complete sweep, say, we've now looked everywhere, we've exhausted the entire search, this is what we found, because you're creating, it's, it's another news cycle every time you discover some documents. Absolutely, and especially because they're going to try to equate this with Donald Trump and his documents. And so I hope that Biden and his team are very aggressive in showing the differences in those two cases. One, I mean, really, it shows how Biden's team is transparent because it was Biden's attorneys who discovered the documents, whereas with Trump, they were demanded back, you know, by outsiders. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, at this point, there have been 20 or so documents found that Biden had, whereas Trump, there are over 300. Um, some of them mar marked top secret. Um, and also, as we're seeing how Biden is complying and, 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 and showing that he's participating and ensuring that he has, you know, that he corrects this wrong. Whereas Trump, of course, as we know, there is a whole obstruction of justice situation. So I hope that they highlight that and keep reminding people that this is not the same thing whenever somebody brings it up. Um, Mustafa, again, um, D.C. loves process. They love a scandal. Uh, and Republicans are going to leech onto this. You know, the, the House is going to do all they can. Uh, and this is where, from the administration standpoint, uh, and this is where sometimes you can be, you know, so open, so transparent that you create more problems for yourself. We know the yahoos and the, la the last fool who was there, it wouldn't have happened. Right. Well, we know when President Trump was there, there was intentionality in him taking documents as was shared. You know, this is a diversion um, from Republicans to the fact that we have a number of significant issues that they have no idea yet how to deal with. They don't have a plan. They don't have policy. Um, so they want to make sure that, that folks continue to focus here. This also, as you said, is the media once again. There are a huge amount of important critical stories that are out there that have everyday impacts in people's lives, and they're not focusing on those. I think this is also, to be fair, an opportunity uh, for our current president to make sure that they tighten up the process. 
um, because many of these documents, of course, are from an earlier time. Uh, you know, we know that our president is, is very focused on doing the right things. They have reacted in a proper way and saying, you know, we're going to take a look, we'll find what's out there, and we'll make sure that it gets back to the right individuals and follow the Presidential Records Act moving forward. So there are going to be staffers who are going to make sure that they understand what the requirements are. And I think that that just strengthens the process, not only for this president, but as we move forward with whomever might be president in the future. Um, and again, you've got all the back and forth, all the back and forth that's going to happen, um, um, you know, in these press briefings and and you're going to have folks all trying to get on television. And look, they're going to make this out to be uh, the, the worst thing in the world. And it's it, 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 you name it, it's all going to happen. And that's what uh, is uh, going on. I do want to sit here and say this here. President Biden um, talked um, on Monday when he spoke to the National Action Network uh, when it came to the issue of student debt relief. And he said uh, that uh, I have your back on this. This is going to be a continued fight, Jason. Uh, of course, we now know the lawsuits that have been going on as well. Uh, this is one of those issues that uh, black uh, young folks uh, care about, just like other young folks as well. Uh, but we are more affected by, than anybody else. And so African Americans want to see this administration have a vigorous fight uh, to save student debt relief. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope uh, he can do everything possible with his executive power, because we know it's not going anywhere with uh, some of the crazies that we have in the House. Uh, many of them, you know, like Lauren Boebert, who is a recent high school graduate uh, and, and never, you know, doesn't have the debt uh, concerns that many other Americans, particularly black Americans, particularly black women, have uh, with education debt. And he says he's going to fight, and I'm really hoping to see that. And I'm hoping to see also a fight on voting rights. Um, that's something that, you know, we didn't see the, the progress that we wanted. We, they had two pieces of legislation up, and, and neither one of them got through. And it seemed like the White House kind of threw their hands up. I'm hoping that they're going to go forward with these things uh, that Black people want, because let's be 100 percent honest, the majority of of white people <coughs> did not vote for Joe Biden. The majority of white women did not vote for, for Joe Biden while they always <coughs> call the suburban white woman vote. The people who voted in large number for Joe Biden were black men and black women. Uh, they are the base. So just like Trump fed the base, I hope that uh, Joe Biden uh, really fights for this student debt relief, uh, which will, of course, help to increase wealth for many black people and allow for black men and women to start families, which is an incredibly important thing. Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, and uh, also today, uh, uh, also uh, today at the White House, uh, the Golden State Warriors, uh, they dropped by the White House and they, uh, of course, um, uh, were there after winning. They chose not to go to the White House uh, when that other fool was there. Uh, and so President Joe Biden, as well as Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, both uh, greeted them. They were invited to the White House uh, by both of them. Uh, Steph Curry, uh, he spoke. Uh, and uh, while he was there, uh, he also uh, addressed the issue uh, of uh, the, the White House's involvement uh, with uh, Brittany Griner. Uh, and so it was great to actually see that happen. And so uh, here is what uh, Steph said. It's uh, something that we don't ever take for granted. Uh, seven years ago, I believe, we were here last celebrating our first championship and now back to celebrate our fourth. So um, to have this opportunity to reflect on the accomplishment last year, to uh, bring everybody together to celebrate that, to also acknowledge the, the play sports has and bringing people together from all walks of life, all backgrounds, um, to provide inspiration, hope, love, uh, togetherness. And that's what our journey was last year. Uh, so to have another opportunity to celebrate that means a lot. And uh, a great opportunity for us uh, from the basketball community to thank um, President Biden and his staff uh, for all their hard work and diligence on uh, getting Brittany Griner home. Uh, it was a big part of uh, our, our basketball family. And uh, it means a lot to know that she's here and home safe with her family and all the work that went on behind the scenes to make that a reality. So. I uh, just want to say thank you there, and uh, very excited to be here and celebrate the day, celebrate with our families, and uh, appreciate the invitation. This is uh, truly, truly special, so thank you to everybody. Thank you, guys. Appreciate thank it. you so much.
And of course, there were many folks, uh, Randy, who really uh, pressed upon this administration to bring Brittany Gardner home. And they had to. I, you know, she is a black woman who is gay, and I don't believe that under any other administration that she would have been brought home, to be very honest with you. And I don't even know if people had not pushed. I mean, I really love the activism that was behind supporting this sister and getting her home because people would not let it go. And the, the pressure was applied. And so, yes, I'm so just happy that, that she is home. And, and, and really even just to see Steph Curry call her a part of the basketball family because, you know, as a DEI person, that, you know, uh, women in sports is, is given more respect these days than Got it has it. been in the past. Uh, indeed, indeed. And so uh, that was uh, a very good thing there at the White House. All right, folks, uh, got to go to a break. We come back. We'll talk with freshman Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, and folks, uh, also do not forget uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered has been nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Uh, we were nominated and you have an opportunity to actually vote uh, for that nomination, folks. Uh, you can cast your ballot, uh, and there's a process for you to do so. So all you have to do is go to NAACPImageAwards.net, NAACPImageAwards.net. Uh, uh, and then what you do is you scroll down to the category, Outstanding News Information Series or Special. Uh, you then uh, look for Roller Martin Unfiltered, Black Votes uh, Matter Election Night Coverage. Uh, you then click on Vote. And then you scroll down uh, to uh, scroll back to the categories. You click on submit votes. And then what you also do is you register your vote with the email of your choice. Only one vote is allowed per email address. Then you have to confirm that you are not a robot. And then you click vote. You can skip. To, you can choose to skip or vote in all the categories. Voting ends February 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and so please uh, do so. Also, folks. Uh, we've uh, also got uh, some good news, and that is um, Roller Mart Unfiltered and the Black Star Network were actually now on Amazon News. That's right, on Amazon News. You can now check us out uh, on Amazon News. Uh, and so uh, this, they're part of the Amazon's Fire TV network. You need a Fire Stick, which is Amazon's version of Roku or Apple TV. You can get those from Amazon.com. When you log on, go to Amazon News and search for Black Star Network. You'll see us there along with MSNBC, CNN, and all the major news networks. Simply click on our icon. While you're there, you can make it one of your favorites, which means it'll pop up front and center on the screen whenever you log in. If you have an Alexa, it's even simpler. Just say Black Star Network network and it'll take you right to our live feed along with our videos on demand. You can also access an audio only version of Black Star Network through Alexa if you can't make it to a screen. With your help, we're building the most powerful independent black voice in the world, Black Star Network, now on Amazon News. We'll be right back. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network.
It's Kim Whitley. Yo, what's up? This your boy Ice Cube. Hey, yo, Peace World. What's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon. And you're watching Roller Martin, Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, Congress is back in session. Republicans now control the House uh, for Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett. That is not unfamiliar. She has spent her time the last several years in the Texas legislature. Republicans have been in control there as well. Uh, she joins us right now on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, it took forever uh, for you and the other newbies to actually get sworn in because Republicans couldn't make up their mind about Kevin McCarthy to be their Speaker of the House. Uh, and and we've, al we've already seen uh, really what their focus is when you look at the rules change, how they want to roll back uh, the funding for uh, 87,000 IRS agents. They want to protect the rich in this country as well. So uh, what do you make of what you see from your uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle thus far? <laughs> First of all, it's good to see you. But, I mean, Roland, you and I both knew what it was going to be. <laughs> I mean, we could have been hopeful Right. But this is a party that has increasingly um, decided that it was going to show us who they are um, and they were going to do it and not be ashamed about it. You know, you just talked about a number of racist attacks and the extremism. You have been talking about this for quite some time um, right now. As far as I'm concerned, we've got white supremacy leading the party that has an R in front of it. I don't know where the real Republicans are, but. I'm, I'm like the song right now, will the real Republicans please stand up, please stand up? Um, because what we're dealing with now is 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 not what the American people sent us to D.C. to do. Well, the fact of the matter is the real Republicans are standing up, uh, and you see what happens. Uh, you got that nutcase out of Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene. They've appointed her to the, to the Homeland Security Committee. Talk about one of the folks who was involved in the January 6th domestic attack on the United States. They also appointed election deniers as well. And so they are perfectly comfortable uh, with these folks who were participants in the attempted insurrection against the United States. Yeah, I mean, you talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene, but, you know, in my class, we've got George Santos. And Santos specifically asked for financial services. The one thing that he definitely should be nowhere near is financial services. And that's exactly the committee that he wants to go to. Um, now, allegedly, McCarthy told him that he will not get a seat on that committee. We will see what happens. But, you know, we do have this situation where it's the tail that is wagging the dog, right? Um, where it is just this small, and I say it's a small portion of the Republicans, but honestly, I think that there are definitely Republicans that sit back and say, you know what, I'm going to let them say everything that I'm thinking, but I agree with everything that they're doing. And so they hide behind um, this facade of I'm a moderate or I'm reasonable, and they let, you know, certain people like Matt Gates and they'll let um, Bobert and Marjorie Taylor Greene like be the face of all the drama when in actuality um, they really agree with the positions that they've taken. And, you know, what we saw, though, on the floor when we were trying to get voted in was that seemingly we don't have a two-party system anymore. Um, seemingly within the Republican Party, there really is this other faction that has arisen and exists. And so uh, when people talk about bipartisanship, I think right now we've got some tripartisanship that needs to go on because literally we could not get a speaker so that we could all get sworn in simply because there was a group of people that said we're not going to stand with our party. Um, essentially, they weren't really standing with us either, but uh, they were standing with us at least to the extent that we all agree that Kevin McCarthy was not equipped. And uh, as we go through this term, I think it will be clear as to why the Republican Party really is not equipped to continue to lead uh, the House and definitely should not take the reins over the Senate and definitely don't need a place in the White House. Uh, well, and speaking of Santos, go to my iPad, Henry. Uh, you see he got, he, he got two committee uh, appointments, uh, one on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, uh, and then he also on the House Committee on Small Business. Didn't he lie about owning a business? So I'm like, why in the hell is he on that committee? He's lied about everything. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, one of the things that I said when the lie started to come out was, do we even know that this is his real name? And where are all the people that wanted to look for Obama's birth certificate? I mean, we got somebody who admittedly is an immigrant, 
who also we know had charges pending in a whole other country. So, you know, I'm like, why aren't we asking these questions now? All of a sudden we want to trust the word of somebody who literally has only revealed to us that the one thing that we should trust is that he's most likely not telling the truth. Um, I will say that, you know, small business, there probably was a little bit of space. It probably wasn't one of the more competitive committees. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, he really shouldn't have any committee assignments at all because we are entitled to so much sensitive information information that I'm just not really sure should be in his hands right now. I know that he was duly elected, so I, or I, I say duly, um, he was elected. Uh, and so, yeah, he was going to get sworn in. I knew that we weren't going to be able to stop that. But just like Marjorie Taylor Greene did not have committee assignments, um, or she was stripped of her committee assignments in the last term, I think that uh, until these investigations have been completed because of the seriousness of the nature of them, because of the own admissions that he's made, because he is under investigation not only by the DOJ, not only does he have ethics complaints that have been lodged against him, he's got a local prosecutor looking at him, as well as the New York State's Attorney's Office. I think that all of that is a very compelling reason as to why we should not seat him um, on any committee at this point in time. Uh, questions uh, from the panel. Mustafa, you first. Yes, well, Representative, well, welcome to Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, and I know all your sisters of Delta Sigma Theta are excited for you being there. You know, when you were in the Texas House, you introduced a number of pieces of really important legislation. As you get started um, with the uh, Republican House uh, in place, what are some of the things that you hope to be able to achieve? Yeah, so <laughs> this, is, this is tough, considering what this House looks like. Um, but some of the pieces of legislation that I was able to move were actually around marijuana. Um, so there is a space in which the Freedom Cauc Caucus kind of comes around um, and they come all the way around to where they're a little bit left. And so marijuana is one of those spaces. And so we see that we've got a majority of states that have legalized marijuana in some way. We know that drug crimes have disproportionately affected minorities for years and years. And we know that they continue to disproportionately affect minorities and because I serve a majority minority district, I think that this is a great place to start because currently we have a memorandum of understanding that allows for these states to operate. But I think that we need to go a step further. I think that we all need to be pushing for um, full legalization, which would afford more opportunities for these businesses and start to change some of the practices around these businesses. A lot of these businesses, while they are not considered to be legal businesses, they still are uh, taxed by the federal government and they still have some, some say so over what they get to do. One of those things is that they are prevented from hiring people that actually have convictions for drug crimes. So once again, um, we are in a space in which we are still um, being pushed out um, they made money off of our bodies, and now they're making money uh, another way, right? So it's like, well, if we can't have the bodies anymore, then we'll make the money this way, yet still they're boxing us out. So I think marijuana legislation is something that I may be able to um, forge ahead on, especially because I think that we can get bipartisan support around the idea that businesses need an opportunity to be able to put their money uh, into banks and things like that. I also think that it's important that we lay down a marker, if nothing else, as relates to interstate commerce um, and abortion access. I know that a lot of these crazy state houses, including mine, um, now that they have passed some of the most extreme abortion bans in the country, they want to go a step further and tell a woman that she is not allowed to cross state lines. I, I know that they should know, but it's a lot of things that Texas should know, that that is infringing upon interstate commerce, and that is something that falls clearly within the purview of the federal government. And so I think that we need to codify that. And then finally, because I'm sure somebody else may have a question, um, coming from the state of Texas, I've got to deal with guns. And so I want to look at what are our options as far as expanding um, homeland security and what it is that falls under their purview, because we see a lot of these mass shooters, which Texas leads in mass shootings right now. Got it. They have been online and they have basically said that they were going to do these things. And I would like for Homeland Security to be able to go in and investigate. All right. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, we appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. And we'll see what happens with the craziness in the House where Republicans now controlling it. Thanks. 
All right, folks, gotta come, we come back, we'll talk uh, humanitarian crisis in Somalia. Also, a lot of people are mad at uh, a, uh, Ed Reed, the new head football coach at Bethune-Cookman, uh, because of his some comments on social media. I will share my thoughts about that uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Plus, I also want to talk about MLK Day. Are we doing this thing wrong? Why is there a focus on a day of service? Shouldn't we be protesting? Hmm. Huh. We'll talk about that on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Blackstone Network. <clears throat> Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, people can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated, this goes for males and females. Trust your gut, and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step -step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. How y'all doing? It's your favorite funny girl, Amanda Seals. Hi, I'm Anthony Brown from Anthony Brown and Group Therapy. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, Hall of Famer Ed Reed is the latest professional athlete hired by an HBCU to be their head football coach. He was uh, hired by Bethune-Cookman uh, University. He has not signed his contract yet, so he's technically not the head coach yet. Uh, but he's already started, and he caused an uproar on social media uh, the other day uh, on Sunday uh, when he, he did a live stream and he posted uh, this particular video here. Uh, I'm going to show it for you. Uh, again, a lot of people were mad, upset. Uh, folks have been uh, trashing him, saying he's wrong. Others say, you know what? We think Ed Reed is right. Watch this. I've been mutting and showing shit. I chose not to. But now I'm out here walking with the football team, picking up trash. But I'm mutting us. Man, get out of here, man. I should leave. I'm not even under contract doing this. I'm mutting us. Man, get out of here, man. They mutt me. These motherfuckers ain't even clean my goddamn office when I got here. I'm mutting y'all. Get your ass, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. All this shit here was trash in front of me. Who you think got this shit cleared out? That building right there got trash in it. It's fucking trash. What are you talking about? need no goddamn donors to come out and help out because people just want money. That's why I don't hell, that's why I don't fuck with social network. Fuck out of here, man. I've been mutting and showing shit. I chose not to, but now I'm out here walking with oh, the foot. Um, he had previously done a video. He was complaining about uh, uh, conditions there, saying there are people who were at the university, uh, frankly, who were not looking out on behalf of the students. Uh, it caused a huge uproar. Of course, he then uh, took the social media to apologize. He issued this particular statement here. He said, in regard to my social media comments about the university staff and other institutions, I would like to sincerely apologize to all BCU staff, students, and alumni for my lack of professionalism. My language and tone were unacceptable as a father, coach, and leader. My passion for our culture, betterment, and bringing our foundation 
up got the best of me and I felt victim while engaging with antagonists on social media as well. I'm fully aware of the hardworking folks at our school who are also fighting to make things better and more financially sound. I am encouraged from my communication with my AD and our administration and understand it's a work in progress. My passion is about getting and doing better and that goes for me too. Now, he earlier had made a comment uh, where he said that he had agreed with Deion Sanders where he said there's a broke mentality uh, that exists among uh, HBCU administrators. And so folks got just lit. They were upset and mad and, and all of that because of what Ed Reed had to say. So let me unpack what, what, what my thoughts on here. And that is this here. It's a lot of people out here uh, who have a lot to say. But the reality is most people have never actually worked in a black-owned institution. Let, let, me, let me repeat that, have never actually worked in one. First of all, uh, there are 230,000 students that are black students that attend H, excuse me, 230,000 students that attend HBCUs. 20% of HBCU students are non-black, okay? There are 1.5 to 1.6 million black students that attend PWIs. Now, when you look at uh, HBCUs, a little, little more than 100 in the country, you look at black newspapers, a little more than 100 in the country. And so when you start talking about black-led institutions, we could talk about black newspapers, we could talk about black churches, we could talk about black-owned businesses. Pre-COVID, uh, there were 2.6 million black-owned businesses in America. 2.5 million of those black-owned businesses uh, were, uh, had one employee doing about average revenue of $54,000. Why am I saying all of that? Because the reality is there is a consistent thread when you begin to look at black institutions, lack of resources, a surviving mentality versus a thriving mentality based upon the conditions in which they have been confronted with. When I listen to a Deion Sanders or an Ed Reed or others, and let me be perfectly clear, uh, I've done 19 commencements, 15 at HBCUs. I've actually visited, spoken at, and been on the campus of at least 66 of the nation's 107 HBCUs. Uh, I've had numerous conversations uh, with HBCU presidents and uh, administrators and alumni. So and let me be real clear. And also, I've been to Bethune-Cookman several times, even addressing their alumni about fundraising. So for folk who say, well, man, you didn't go to one, trust me, I got receipts. And the reality is this here. When you, begin, when you work in an institution, you're seeing things in a much different way. You're looking at conditions of places. The reason I understand where Ed Reed is coming from is I run three black newspapers. And I can tell you what happens when you begin to challenge status quo. And I know somebody who's watching and saying, well, man, that ain't right. So I'll give you a perfect example. 1990, 1999, I became uh, executive editor of the Houston Defender. That was the first place I had worked at, we actually got paid for, paid in 1990. I came back nine years as the managing editor. And we were actually at a conference, at an NNPA conference in New York City. And we were sitting in a meeting and uh, they were going back and forth and the papers were complaining about the lack of advertising dollars that black newspapers were getting from Comp USA. At the time, Tom Jonah Morning Show uh, and Tavis Smiley had went after Comp USA for their advertising. And so I'm sitting there listening to the conversation and as they're talking and as they're talking. And after about 30 minutes, I really got fed up with the conversation and I raised my hand. I said, let me ask y'all a question. If Comp USA asked any of you to send them your media kit via uh, PDF and email, could you do it? Somebody in the back uh, said, uh, who is that young nigga up there talking? And y'all don't, I don't use the N words. I'm only telling using that because I'm, I'm quoting what happened. I said, a young, I said, a young nigga with email who knows what a PDF is. I said, you can't sit in this room and complain about Comp USA not buying ads in black newspapers if you yourself don't even use computers. And so when you are hearing these criticisms, there are people who get real defensive. And, and I was in these meetings, the people, they were sitting there telling me, well, you know, Roland, we can't do this and we can't do that and we can't afford to do this. And I said, wait, 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 hold up. 
This ain't about whether you can afford to do something. The question is, what are the basic fundamental things that you're doing? And so when you start talking about facilities, you got to ask yourself the question. Okay, you are mad at Ed Reed for his comments. Here's the question. Was he speaking the truth about trash on the campus? It's either yes or no. Do you have staff who actually does that? It's yes or no. He said, my office, he said, my office wasn't even clean. This is a very basic question. Was the, were the coach's offices clean before he arrived? And if the coach's offices were not clean before he arrived, why not? You now got to start asking yourself the question. What about the team's conditions? The locker rooms? I've heard complaints from other universities where teams are washing their own clothes. Why? You got to begin to ask these questions. See, what we have to start stop doing as black folks, we've got to stop being so defensive about our black institutions and begin to ask the questions, are these things right and how do you fix them? Every answer is not well, we don't have. Y'all, I've been there. And if y'all want to sit here and go there, Houston Defender, Dallas Weekly, uh, Dallas Examiner, Chicago Defender. When I took over the Chicago Defender, it was horrible. Nobody wanted that job. Nobody. We couldn't, we couldn't afford to uh, get the furnace fixed because every time they got called somebody out, they wouldn't pay anybody. Okay? Folks said, we have to get paid in cash, we ain't doing it. It was dirty, it was dusty, it was nasty. It was 20 degrees in the winter, and it was 100 degrees in the summer. It was called the Chicago Offender because of all the errors in the newspaper versus its actual name, the Chicago Defender. Folks didn't get paid on time. I can go on and on and on. But see, the difference is, I had worked in black institutions, and so I came in with a plan in terms of being able to fix it. Chicago Defender lost money 20 consecutive years when I got there in 2004. We lost money my first year. We made a $100,000 profit my second year, a $400,000 profit my third year. Why am I saying that? It's because at some point, we as black people have got to stop being so defensive when it comes to our churches, our schools, and our businesses, and they begin, begin to ask the question, are we doing things the wrong way as opposed to the right way? Congressman John Lewis, the late Congressman John Lewis, when he got the NAACP Sping Arm Medal in Houston, he said this about his mother. He said, when he, he said, my mother used to sweep the dirt of our front yard. He said, we were so poor we didn't have grass in our front yard. He said, but she would sweep the dirt when the company was covering over because she wanted the, front, the dirt front yard to be neat. And so what I'm saying is, and again, my first black paper was a Houston Defender. Sonsiri Masai Giles, she did things the right way in terms of how she ran it. So that was my floor. I saw how she ran a black paper. So that became the standard for me, and I said, I'm going to build upon that. And so if we are going to transform our institutions, what we've got to do is stop being defensive. And then, yes, and Ed Reed made broad generalizations about all HBCUs. That is a mistake. But go talk to some HBCU presidents, and they'll tell you about the conflicts with the board of directors. They'll tell you about the problems. Go talk to HBCU faculty who will talk about the issues they have as well. There are some commonalities that do exist among our institutions. And what we have to begin to do is get real about those very challenges. If you got trash, it got to be picked up. If grass needs to be cut, grass needs to be cut. We have to, whatever we have, take care of what we got. But what we cannot do is act as if what Ed said somehow was 100% wrong. We can't act like what Dion said was 100% wrong. We can criticize, we can say, don't generalize, but what I'm trying to get us to understand as somebody who is working in my 13th black-owned media experience, I kind of know what the hell I'm talking about. 
And I've had enough conversations with black people in black institutions about what needs to be happen in terms of how we have to fix them and run them. So let's stop being so defensive and mad and upset when somebody who didn't go to an HBCU, who then becomes, comes to work for one, begins to ask some questions. Because if the whole point is to raise the place, if the whole point is to bring in additional resources with one's context, isn't that the point? Some folk need to check themselves. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, people can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated, this goes for males and females. Trust your gut, and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step -step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. So I'm seeing a lot of the comments uh, in our uh, ch uh, chat, and people like, man, he shouldn't have been cussing, okay? So which is it? You mad he cussed, or you mad what he had to say? I mean, I mean, I mean which is it? And again, I've read all the comments. I've seen all the people had to say. And really what I think this is, Mustafa, uh, Randy, uh, and Jason, what I really think this is, is that a lot of times we as African Americans, we, man, we can't be airing our dirty laundry as if the laundry ain't already aired. And the thing is, it's about how do we change. I'm, and the reason I, I, I get it, I heard so many people, man, these people talk about black newspapers, but they ain't never worked at one. Okay, what about those who have? Well, then what about our, what, what do we have to say? And what, what we're talking about here, Randy, is that we're not talking about how do we achieve black excellence. No, how do we achieve excellence, period? Again, my framework for a black newspaper was formed by a black newspaper. How Sonny Masai Giles ran the Chicago Defender in terms of how she paid, in terms of being paid on time, in terms of how our offices looked, all those different things. She said, I'm running a first class operation. I can tell you point blank, Randy, that ain't been the case at some other black media places I've run in terms of how they've done business. I just think that we sometimes are so sensitive to criticism that we get mad about tone and ignore substance. You're right. If we're honest, you're absolutely right. We are sensitive um, because we don't have a lot. I mean, we haven't been, we don't have a lot um, because of, you know, the situation in this country. And so what we do have, like our black institutions, like our HBCUs, 
um, we hold very dear. Uh, I'm a graduate of Tuskegee University, grew up on Hampton University's campus where my mother, grandmother, and everybody went, and my mother was also a professor. And so I do have this protective nature about HBCUs, and it hurts. I take it personally when people well, say well, okay, negative okay, things. Okay, since, since you mentioned Tuskegee, here's a perfect yeah. example. Tuskegee mm -hmm. had a president and the board did not tell, the, the, the board was supposed to notify the president within 90 days of his contract whether it was going to get renewed. And they didn't. So right. he's like, I don't know what's going on. And so he got a job interview and he went and did it. He comes right. back, they fire him by saying, how dare you go on the job interview? He's like, hey, I got a family. Y'all were supposed to notify me based upon my contract. And, right. and, and, and here's my whole deal. If you Tuskegee or any other HBCU, you should be worried if your president is not being pursued by somebody else, because that means don't nobody else want him. Oh, no, I agree with you. I, I, I'm just saying, it, it, I think it is difficult for us, but I do think that we are a people, I believe, that has become married to the struggle sometimes. Yes. And that our eyes are down. And we need to be willing to put raise our heads up and look at things honestly as they are. One, to, to, to first own that we can do better. Yes. We deserve better. We have the resources to do better. And to do that, that means you have to look at where you are honestly and critically. It's hard, absolutely. I understand the defensiveness, but it is absolutely necessary that we talk about the problems that we have. But it's we not, need to do better. But Jason, it's not hard when your goal are the people you're serving. And here's what I mean by that. When, when I, uh, I remember when uh, I was getting this back and forth uh, when it came to um, uh, the newspaper and, and folk uh, were upset with me uh, with some cuts I made uh, and some changes I made. And in fact, when I was in Chicago, uh, that was some Negroes who actually were protesting me because of the changes I made. And the folk on the inside were all scared. They were like, protest. I said, mm-mm. I said, don't lock the front door. Bring me the subscription cards. And first of all, what they did is they, they, they paid some folk down at, uh, at the shelter. They only, they only could afford them for 45 minutes because they gave them some food and about $30. Uh, and so they were protesting. And so I walked outside, and they were sitting there passing out pamphlets uh, talking about boycott the Chicago Defender. I said, give me some subscription cards. And so I walked right behind them. I, every time they went to a car and gave them a leaflet, I gave them a subscription card. said, they can kiss my ass, they can go to hell. And I said, no, y'all ain't, ain't gonna sit here and play this game with me. And then there were some people in Chicago, I'll never forget, Don Jackson, Circle City Productions. Uh, and he was like, well, they had a reception for me and we were at uh, the Disciple. And he said, well, you know, you know, Defender, it's really awful. I don't know if you can turn it around. I said, oh, it's gonna get turned around. He said, we'll see. I said, oh yeah, you will see. See, I knew what I was going to do. I wasn't willing to run from how awful the paper was. I wasn't willing to run from how bad it was. But what I did say is, I'm gonna show y'all asses how to fix it. And we did. That's how you deal with it. You don't sit here and get mad because somebody called you out. I didn't get mad what Don had to say. I said, I'm gonna show you, I'm going to fix it. Right, that's exactly, you know, I agree with you 100%. I look at someone like Ed Reed, who is investing his, his time. He doesn't need the money. He's the greatest safety to ever play the game. Yes, maybe I have a little bit of Baltimore bias there, but uh, I, I really don't think it's a question. He doesn't need the money. He's doing this because he wants to change things. And one of the things that you do as a head coach is you change the culture. And one of the things that he clearly wants, it, it reminds me of an old joke, Roland. Uh, I'm sure you saw, I think it was Friday, you know, next Friday or whatever, where... Uh, you know, Day Day says to Ice Cube, he says, uh, you know, they tried to mess up my 20s. And then Ice Cube looks out and he says, yo, those are 10s. What did, what did Day Day respond? But I keep them clean, though. So at the very least, do what you can with what you have. Right. If you want these black athletes to go and not go where Ed Reed went to the University of Florida and to skew the, the Power Five conferences and not go to the SEC, then you have to, at the very least, have good, clean facilities, 
not just, hey, we're going to give you a good education, because they can get a good education at the University of Florida. They can get a good education at the University of Georgia. They can get a good education at the University of Maryland, and they will if they choose to go there. But yeah. one of the things that I think needs to happen is, at the very least, you have to take that pride. Someone has to mow the lawn. Someone has to line the field. The practice field has to look good. The locker room has to be clean. There are things that need to be done, and people need to be there. They have to have and a good equipment manager or uh, uh, somebody to an ice bath. These basic things that are for their, the well-being of the athlete, well-being of students, they have to have clean dorms. These are things that you absolutely have to have if you want for uh, students to have the best experience possible. It can't be, yes, look at the history and we've done this. Yes, but you've got to have good facilities and do the very best you can to thrive instead of, well, we're just, you know, we're just making it. You should be proud that you went to Morehouse or you should be proud and here, you went to Howard University. And, and here's, That's not going to fly. And here's the thing, Mustafa. Uh, again, I think a lot of people were upset because he was angry, he was bothered. And, and uh, yes, he was, he was very... He was clearly ticked off in those videos. And uh, my, my, my advice is, Doc, d d d don't get that emotional about it. Because, again, as somebody who has been in black-owned media, I've walked into... I'm telling... Y'all have no idea how awful the Chicago Defender was. Then I had people who, on the inside, who were fighting me the whole time. They was... They wanted me out so bad, they released my salary to the public, and a fool gonna send us a letter uh, with my salary in it. I know damn well he got it from the inside. And I told the cats on the inside, y'all can kiss my ass too. Because guess what? I like, y'all clearly couldn't fix it, and that's why I'm here. And so I think what has to happen is, whether you are an Ed Reed or you were Dion or some other people, I think what you have to do is, you have to, in a very different way, lay out, here's our problem. This is what we are facing. And you come to the public and you say it. You literally say, and again, for me, I wouldn't do it in that emotional way. I would say, I want y'all to see what our facilities look like. This is our locker room. Y'all, this is unacceptable. This is this, this is this. Now, there may be some university people who are still gonna be pissed off because, oh man, you putting our business out there. No, I'm showing you exactly what we actually have. Now, rolling, because I've done this, I'm going to lay out my three-year plan. I'm going to say, this is what I need. This is what I need for us to, us to build. This is what I need for us to raise. That's how I'm going to do it. And so, but, we, but what we can't not do is we've got to stop Mustafa being angry when somebody is pointing out deficiencies mm -hmm. and then say, here's my plan to raise us up from where we are. I can't accept the deficiencies. As somebody who hates litter, I'm kind of with it. I lose my damn mind when it comes to trash. That's just how I am. I'm OCD like that. But it's about raising our institutions and not getting mad when somebody is demanding better. Go ahead. You know, we use the words black excellence, and sometimes we don't understand everything that needs to go into that. We ask our students for black excellence. So they should be surrounded with that excellence in and, and all forms and fashions. And, and part of black excellence is actually evaluation. As you just shared, it is about evaluating where we currently are and where we want to go to. And then the activation comes into that of putting that plan in place. And that plan may mean some folks have to go, some things have to change, or we grow and build upon the things that, that are positive and that are moving forward. So in everything that we do, we have to actually begin to uh, take a deeper look into what does black excellence actually look like and what do we need to do to be able to support that. And I'll just close with, if we truly care about our HBCUs, then everyone should be making sure that we are actually helping to support them financially right. and other ways as well. That's it. And so, again, you, you use black excellence, I use excellence. Because here's why. There are some people, and because of my experience, some folks have been, some folks have been like, well, you know, this is a black company. And when I was at TV One, I said this, and I said this to anybody who works in this show here. If you say, well, you know we are a black company, you will be looking for another job. 
Because what you're actually saying subliminally is that we are second class when you actually say that. And so those things actually happen. And so for me, I don't care whether it's a, I don't care whether I work to the Austin American Statesman or the Fort Worth Star Telegram, I wanna see a clean newsroom. I don't wanna see equipment broken. I wanna see excellent all around. For me, there is no standard. Somebody called me once and they said, hey man, I need to get your, I need to get, I need to get your speaking rate, I need the black rate. I said, ain't no black rate. The black rate, same as the white rate, it's the green rate. And again, <laughs> we have to demand more from our institution. When I say more, meaning if you're gonna demand it from them, demand it from us. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far-reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. I'm Bill Duke. This is Diallo Riddle, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Stay woke. Folks, Somalia is facing a, a hunger and poverty problem that they have not seen uh, in uh, decades. The humanitarian crisis has surged due to historic weather changes causing massive drought and a 20-year insurgency by al-Qaeda. The United Nations Children's Fund says more than 500,000 children could die by the middle of this year unless urgent action is taken. Currently, most children admitted to Somalia's hospitals don't make it because families don't have the means to make it to medical facilities in time for life-saving medical care. To dis discuss this issue is Abdi, a board member from the uh, Mood Foundation, a Texas-based nonprofit that's helped communities uh, in the Horn of Africa uh, for over 22 years. Um, uh, glad to have you uh, on the show. Uh, Abdi, here's the thing. Uh, when I think back to um, We Are the World, uh, that was an idea that originated with Harry Belafonte. Somalia was one of the places, Ethiopia was one of the places where Harry and others went. They were talking about uh, the crisis uh, when it came to children. Uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, many of these different places. Uh, and, 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 and so when you think about this, uh, we're back to it. And unfortunately, uh, when I think about Rwanda, when I think about so many of these, these, uh, these humanitarian crises uh, in, in African nations, what happens is, and this is why I'm saying this, in the United States, we often talk about what's in the economic interest of the United States. And so our response to that is different than a humanitarian crisis. Ukraine 
that is seen as in the economic foreign national security interest of the United States. And so all the focus about the folks who were dying there, but over here, when you talk about a half a million dead, you pretty much have silence. Right. So uh, thank you for having me on, on the show. Uh, this is my first time that I went to, the, to this show. Uh, yes, Somalia has been, this crisis has been in the making for the last 30 years. We went through a civil war for 30 years. We have an al-Shabaab uh, 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 extreme group that is part of basically our problem. We have a climate change that's basically prevalent in our part of the world. And we've been left out to spend ourselves basically to struggle and basically work on those three issues, three factories. And we cannot, as a Somali, figure it out exactly how to bypass this, this, this problem. 30 years of political crisis, we have a government of the governments that did not have any capability of basically uh, uh, putting a system to prevent, to, system to prevent famine to, the, to their own people. We have the Al-Shabaab who basically control certain parts of the country where the famine is prevalent right now in South Central Somalia, where the breadwinner of the Somali people, in the, if you look at it, and we have the uh, climate uh, 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 crisis, basically. Uh, uh, rain used to come every year. Uh, and uh, fertile lands, a lot of basically cultivations. Uh, and now you see the rain comes in every five, six years. So uh, with all these issues, we've been left to fend for ourselves. Uh, big countries like United States and Europeans, uh, and the non-profit organizations, for example, the NGO, the United Nations organizations, if a place is not secure or security is not good, they don't go. So that is the problem that we have. There's a lot of people in Kenya, a lot of organizations in Kenya, and they don't go and deliver the food or whatever that is because they say it is a security issue. Yet, as you mentioned, that they go to Ukraine, they go to any place that has got the same shields. I mean, I'm not belittling Ukraine's basically uh, issues, but the, uh, the whole world has been basically helping Ukraine at this point. And the same amount of people are dying. Uh, in 2011, we have a famine. About 260,000 people died. Half of them were kids. And, and now 2023 or 2022, the projection is about 500,000 kids, kids less than five years old, will die. So it is, that, it is, that, is, uh, that is that is absolutely devastating. There, um, uh, uh, questions for my panel. Let me first start with Mustafa. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm curious. Um, what would you like to see uh, those uh, organizations of color here in this country do to be better supportive of the things that you're trying to address uh, back home? We, uh, we, we we establish as a Somali Americans an organization called Amud Foundation, which is part of which I am part of it, and we are the ground people. We know where to go. You know where the you know security is. We know, we know our people basically, and we distribute we distribute foods. We, we we help orphanages. We create MCHs. We create uh, we deliver dry food. Uh, we deliver water wells. We deliver water on uh, on a trunk on a tracks, uh, medicines, all kind of stuff. What I want from our Black Friends organization is, is to tag up with us, with Amut Foundation or any other organization is, that is indigenous to the, to the cause and help us, either basically help us on, on, on funding raises, uh, raising funds or donating by yourself. And that way, let's be our, be our conduits for everybody who's helping for the Somali cause. I mean, I know there's a lot of kids who are dying. This is... Uh, de deja vu again, 1984, when, when We Are the World was basically, uh, uh, was, was we hearing the song of We Are the World, uh, there's a lot of people are dying, really, and we, we expect and we hope that the uh, uh, African Americans in this country help uh, and chip in as well. And, and you, you can go through us, so you can go to another uh, 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 organization that basically send the, the, the money and the food and the help, and the help uh, directly to the people who are affected. Uh, Randy. <clears throat> it's hard for me to even talk about this. This is very painful, uh, very painful watching uh, this video. Is there a way um, that 
we can put pressure on our country? Are there are, are there are there are there any plans to try to appeal to our government? Or what what has been done? Well, uh, what. I mean, lack of government always causes a lot of issues. Right? When you don't have a, a proper government, the basic necessity of the people of that country will, will, will fall off, basically. And uh, uh, since the uh, 1993 debacle of the Somali uh, black hole down, America basically did not basically come up front and say that we're going to help Somalia again. They kind of like, they, they, they hold their hands and they say, no, that's it, we're done. So... Uh, in, in the political view, there is no movement, basically. No, right. Normally, you have to have a government, a big government, who's pushing you, basically, to stand mm -hmm. a government so you can. You can. But when, when, when you find, when everybody doesn't, everybody's fighting each other and nobody's basically beating the other one, we are all equal, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're there. So, so, yes, we would need a political, uh, 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 political situation, resol resolution, to put Somalia into the front front and make sure that that country comes in as a viable country that help its own people as well as uh, be peaceful with its neighbors. And we still don't have that one with the Europeans or the Americans or anybody else. Um, let's go to Jason. So thank, thank you for coming on. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Uh, I guess the main question that I have is what kind of U.S. I mean, you mentioned Ukraine, uh, where the U.S. is involved. What kind of U.S. intervention from the U.S. government would you want? We've seen uh, the U.S. get involved on the continent of Africa, and it's been disastrous. Uh, you know, I know that they are involved in, in some of the things that are going on with Al Shabaab and trying to deal with that situation. But you know, we saw what happened in Libya. And that did not go well. What kind right. of intervention would you actually want from the U.S. government? Well, first of all, humanitarian. I mean, there's a lot of people who are dying. So food, medicine, all kind of stuff that you can basically stop the bleeding of those people who are dying is very important and very eminent. That, that's the food, number one. Number two is there's a government right now in Somalia. Uh, even though the United States of America is fighting al-Shabaab through the sky, basically they're sending some kind of drones. Uh, we need, I think, to my understanding, we need that help of the United States to give arms. Not the United States military, but at least the United States uh, arms to go to Somalia and build the military and all kind of stuff. And then they can fight al-Shabaab. Now, if al-Shabaab is eliminated, probably then there would be a little hope that people who are fled, there is a lot of IDPs. IDPs is basically people who are left their livelihood, their farming, their, their animals, because they could not cultivate because of the Al-Shabaab or people are taxing. People will go back to their, to their uh, original place and they can basically live in peace or less cultivate. So we need to basically move those IDPs and shut down those IDPs and put, move back to their original uh, locations. And the, only, the first step that we're going to do is to defeat Al-Shabaab. And Al-Shabaab is one of the thorns in Somalia at this point. Uh, the rest will basically come, uh, resolve after in, in a year. But right now, that's our problem. We are fragmented. We don't know exactly where we're going. Nobody listens to nobody. And we need a force, an extra for external force to push it, the Somalis basically into a into a statehood. How can folks uh, help your organization? Uh, they want to see and support. Where do they go? Uh, if they want to support, uh, we have an uh, amutfoundation.org. Amutfoundation.org is uh, our website. Uh, there's a lot of products that we deliver to the people. There's a lot of uh, uh, people uh, 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 donate through the Amut Foundation. If you want to donate to orphanage, MCH, dry food, water well, medicines, schools, all those things. If you look at those, those are the IDP people that would deliver a dry food every day for, 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 for the last three months right now. And our president is in Somalia at this time as, right. uh, assessing exactly what the problem is. So that's where you're going to go. Go to amutfoundation.com. All right. Or we, .org. we will certainly uh, spread the word. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you.
All right, folks, got to go to a break. If you're watching on uh, YouTube, hit that like button. If you're watching on Facebook, hit the share button. The same thing with the Black Star Network. Let folks know that we are live and what we're talking about. Also, support us at what we do. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Uh, also, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your ticket money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-01. One nine six. You can also, of course, uh, go to PayPal, uh, R Martin Unfiltered, pay, uh, Cash App, RM, dollar sign RM Unfiltered, Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zell Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Buy my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Of course, uh, I'm going to be uh, in St. Louis uh, this weekend uh, with uh, the book. I'll be joined with Ted Poe and Michael McMillan uh, with the St. Louis Area Urban League at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, it is open to the public, free and open to the public. Y'all come on out. And then uh, on Sunday, uh, I'll be the special guest at Northside Baptist church uh, in St. Louis as well. So our uh, St. Louis takeover takes place on Saturday. Can't wait to see y'all there. I'll be back in a moment. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far-reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, we're talking about the difficulty of being able to acquire wealth for Black Americans. My guest, Emily Flitter, is the author of The White Wall, How Big Finance is Bankrupting Black America. The bad stuff that you feel when you're dealing with the financial services industry is not your fault. It's not your fault and you don't deserve to be treated like this. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. Hey, I'm Arnaz Jane. Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph and you are watching Roland Martin, unfiltered. I mean, could it be any other way? Really, it's Roland Martin. Alexis Dash was last seen in Tampa, Florida on December 18th. The 14-year-old is 5 feet 1 inches tall, weighs 115 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Alexis Dash should call the Tampa Police Department at 813-231-6130, 813-231-6130. Folks, this is crazy. A former Republican State House candidate uh, was arrested for uh, political shootings geared towards Democrats. Yo, seriously, y'all. Solomon Pena was arrested following a police standoff with SWAT uh, on Monday. He's a 2020 election denier and MAGA Republican. Stands accused of conspiring with Jose and Demetrio Trujillo, along with two other unidentified men, to shoot at the homes of two county commissioners, Adrian Barboa, former commissioner Debbie O'Malley, and two state legislators, state representative Javier Martinez and state senator Linda Lopez. Uh, Pena is charged with four counts of shooting at a dwelling, shooting at uh, or from a motor vehicle, and conspiracy to commit a shooting at a dwelling, and one count each of possession of a firearm by a felon attempt to commit aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and criminal solicitation. My man is seriously uh, uh, in some trouble. No one was injured in the shootings, uh, but uh, that is absolutely crazy. Let's go to Virginia, where a mother is suing the city of Richmond and the police officer facing involuntary manslaughter charges in the crash that killed her 19-year-old daughter. Uh, she's suing for more than $200 million. A grand jury indicted officer Richard D. Johnson on multiple charges, including two counts of involuntary manslaughter and reckless driving in the crash that killed Tracy A. Williams and Jeremiah Ruffin. Tiara Williams' federal lawsuit alleges Johnson was driving a police SUV without its sirens and traveling twice the speed limit when he went through a red light, striking the vehicle her daughter was in on April 7th 
of uh, 2022. The lawsuit claims wrongful death and that Johnson deprived Tracy Williams of substantive due process rights under the 14th Amendment. The Richmond City's Attorney's Office filed a motion to dismiss the claims, arguing the city is protected from the wrongful death claim through sovereign immunity. The city also says the lawsuit does not identify the specific policy Johnson violated, of Johnson, John, policy that Johnson had violated by violating Williams' constitutional rights. Folks, in San Francisco, uh, a city council committee uh, has come up with what they say is a rightful number for black residents to receive reparations. Uh, their particular uh, committee uh, says that black Americans who meet the um, qualifications should get $5 million each if they're an eligible African-American resident of the city. The 15-member San Francisco Reparations Committee was established to determine if reparations were needed to create equity uh, and, the, and the role that San Francisco may have played in upholding slavery. The committee concluded reparations must be adequate, effective, and proportional um, to the gravity of the violations and the harm suffered, and that a lump sum payment would redress economic and opportunity losses that black San Franciscans have endured. Now, the committee also proposes wiping out all debts associated with educational, personal, credit card, and payday loans for black households. A separate task force created by California's leg legislature is also studying reparations. Uh, what do you make uh, of that proposal, uh, Mustafa? You know, my old boss, John Conyers, who introduced uh, H.R. 40 back in 1989, reparations bill, I think that he would be, he would be proud uh, of the work that they did before and the work that's happening in this moment, um, having, you know, these smaller commissions that are actually really taking a deep dive into how do we actually help our communities to heal. Um, so I'll be interested in seeing what uh, comes out of this and if it becomes real for folks to actually be able to receive, um, you know, past payment uh, for all the injustices that have happened there in San Francisco. Randy. <laughs> well, if you want to see people's reactions, uh, read some of the comments on these, on these, um, uh, on the articles. Uh, people are going to fight hard against it, as you, as you well know. Um, one thing is that people do not have an understanding of the history of the United States, which is why critical race theory is so incredibly important. They don't get it. Um, I also just want to mention that, you know, members that of the Holocaust that um, are getting still getting payments to this day, any surviving members, and um, Jews have been paid since 1945. Um, like $90 million has, have been paid out in reparations. Um, but that was because people took accountability for what happened in the Holocaust, whereas there has not been much accountability taken about how African Americans, um, our, our history here in, in, in this country. So, you know, it, it's going to be a hard battle. Jason. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think it's going to be a hard battle, but it's a, a battle worth fighting. And uh, I think that uh, we've seen these small uh, kind of victories where where people are raising the issue of, of reparations and repair. And I love the fact that they're talking not only about things that have happened uh, in the past in terms of slavery and even in, with segregation, but also things like payday loans, which, uh, you know, and other predatory financial practices that where, you know, uh, African Americans in particular are being preyed upon and talking about how uh, black people are still being preyed upon and still uh, need an opportunity to grow wealth. Uh, and that's one of the things that we need in our community. So uh, reparations are, are sorely needed. And I'm glad that there's starting to be these kinds of conversations, even if it doesn't necessarily go anywhere, because you look at, I still look at it as an important step because you look at uh, Georgetown, you look at Evanston, Illinois, you look at what happened in another part of California, uh, where people are, are, are actually starting to see uh, that this is an important step to, to healing and to growing wealth for black communities. All right, folks, time for ABC You Connect. Spike Lee has launched a, a new fellowship for HBCU students at the House. 
his alma mater, of course. Uh, also is Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, Atlanta, and Morris Brown. Morehouse graduate, of course, Spike Lee, has partnered with the Gersh Academy, Gersh, the Gersh Agency, to start the Spike Fellows Program. Fellows selected in the Atlanta University Center Consortium gain access and exposure to opportunities in entertainment as recipients. They will get industry mentorship, a postgraduate internship, full-time employment at the agency. Stakeholders will select the fellows in the AUCC and members of the Gersh Agency's management. Spike said, it is with great honor, privilege, and excitement that I announce the Spike Fellows in association with my partners, the Gersh Agency and the AUCC. From the jump and get-go, I knew when, not if, I opened a crack in the door, I was bringing as many black and brown folks with me in front and behind the camera. Now, folks, only students in the undergraduate programs at those institutions are eligible. Fish University is planning to transform dorm rooms on its campus by using shipping containers. The 24 blue and yellow dorms are planned to be ready for the fall 2023 semester and will house 98 students. Now, Fisk Executive Vice President Jean Fredrickson called the new dorms innovative, edgy, enterprising, and forward-thinking. It's also in part forged by necessity. We have rapid growth and relatively limited liquidity. Fish University has broken ground on the traditional dorm, but won't be ready to house the influx of students they've received. Fish only had about 600, only had about 620 students on campus. They saw record-breaking enrollment in 2022 with more than 400 incoming first-year students. What do you make of uh, those containers as dorms? I uh, wonder how that's gonna go over, Randy. I think it's fantastic. I think it goes back to the story we just spoke about where we have to be innovative and be open to change. And so I, I think it's, it's, it's I think it's great. Mustafa. Yeah, you know, the, that's a part of the whole recycling movement and sustainability, uh, sustainable housing. Um, so this is actually being utilized in a number of different places across the planet. And there are projections that this is uh, some of the types of housing uh, that will be created moving forward over the next 10 years. Jason. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I echo what everyone else on the, on the panel has uh, said, and that is, you know, essentially, if there's a need for housing and you have a way to create it uh, in a way that's equitable and sustainable and all those good things that we talk about, then I think that, you know, we should go ahead and, and do that. And that's what they've done. And I think it's great. Uh, also, folks, uh, Tennessee State University uh, unveiled uh, a significant uh, uh, initiative with what they're going to do with $250 million. Of course, uh, remember, we've been talking about the, the funding crisis uh, there uh, at uh, Tennessee State in terms of what they are owed. Uh, a state committee there uh, said that, um, that they really were owed about $577 million, uh, but uh, they, have, of course, uh, were only allocated uh, that 250, and so a significant part of that uh, is going to deal with, um, of course, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructures. That's one of the things uh, that they're dealing with there. Uh, this is a uh, story uh, that, uh, if, uh, if, let's see if I could pull it up right here for you folks, uh, that one of the local media outlets use. Now, it's not going to be uh, uh, to add on housing, uh, but again, they announced on Monday that the $250 million in state funding Go to my iPad, please. Um, it's going to be used for major infrastructure projects there. Uh, and again, uh, but not dealing with the issue uh, of housing. Uh, and so that's what's going on. It's the single largest one-time investment. This is from State Representative Harold Love Jr. of Nashville. Said this is the single largest one-time investment in an HBCU in the country. Uh, and so that's the announcement there. But still, that's $250 million. They're owed $577 million. So we should still be fighting for additional money. And that's, again, Randy, I'm a, I, in my King Day speech in Wichita, I said, if you ain't having a money conversation, you're not having an American conversation. I, that's right. And they definitely need to fight for that money and not settle, not just say, well, at least we have this. That goes back to my statement about being married to the struggle. They need to get the money owed. Uh, indeed, indeed. So, folks, uh, let's, let's get the rest of that money uh, for Tennessee State. All right, y'all, when we come back, uh, new you in 2023, food choices you make, how that is going to impact your diet, your lifestyle, and also longevity of your life. We'll talk with Dr. Rowe next on Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network.
I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're at SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, uh, we continue our new you in 2023 uh, segments. Uh, we, of course, have been focusing on this since we came back on January 3rd. So we've had a variety of folks, fitness folks, uh, dietitians. We've been talking about smoothies, uh, reducing belly fat, lifting weights, cardio, all that good stuff. Uh, but clearly, if you listened the through line through every interview we've done, uh, is that nutrition is really the most important thing when it comes to changing your life, when it comes to diet and how it impacts everything in your life. And so uh, why not call one of the top experts uh, in this area, uh, Dr. Rowe? She joins us here. Hey, what's happening? I've not what seen you and I don't know how I long. I am the top expert okay, in right. my field. Okay, see, I, Give me my see, props. I, 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 I had other people, see, so I ain't, I ain't about to get into y'all uh, Give uh, me my props. Y'all the internal battles over the, you know, who's the top expert. But Show say, me the one that's been doing one. this for 30 years so like me. top one. Yes. All right, so what's going on? What you got for us? So we, well, I want to talk to you about, you said the through line is nutrition, and it is. Well, the every, line... every, every time we have a fitness person, even they say, look, you can talk about working out all day if you want to. It's 80, 20, 90, 10. I've been you... telling you that for years, right? right? So 80% food, 20% fitness, really. And, and the, most... the reality is in this society, the focus is really 20 on food and 80% on fitness. That's the reality for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? But we want to change that. So what are some of the things that you want to put on your plate? What are some of the things that you want to do that you want to put in your body for your best health? First, you got to have an array of fresh vegetables and fruit. Right, right. And if they're not fresh, get them frozen. You get the same nutrition. And sometimes for, uh, you get a, a much bigger bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. All right, for, so you will. So you want to get that. You do want snacks. No, 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 hold on. First of all, before we move to the snacks, because yeah. let's deal with the fruit. Because yeah. see, I love all these uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube uh, diet experts. Yeah. Because you're going to have people who say, oh, uh, doc, it's too much sugar in the grapes. And then, I, then, then I, I see some people, no, you can't have too much watermelon. And the old oh, banana, no, it's the sugar in the watermelon. Oh, the limit is the I'm, I I'm like, you know what? I, first of all, I, this is why I cuss people out, okay. and they get mad. They like, Roland, you should be cussing people out. But, but seriously, people, folk, they make it sound like hell. You're gonna be eating grapes 24 hours a day. Exactly, and they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Okay. okay, so that's not what we want to do. First of all, the fiber in these fruits and the vitamins and minerals in right. these fruits—you can't throw that out. 
right? So the fiber in the fruit helps to slow down your, uh, helps to slow down the, the, the sugar that would go into the blood and raise your insulin level, Got it. right? But this isn't, that's not what's happening when we talk about fruit as opposed to added sugar in a cookie, a piece of cake, right. and soda, that kind of thing. So whole different story. It's a totally and, and, different story. And also, it's, it's, are you, for you, it's also, it's different fruits. It's not like you're eating grapes, the no, just no. grapes. You want a variety right. of fruit. You want a variety of foods because there's no one food that can make you healthy or that will help you to lose weight. Whatever right. your goal is, there's no one food that will do that. And there's no one food that in the proper quantities can do that. So you need a variety of food in their proper quantities because that's where you get all the nutrients, the antioxidants, the phytochemicals, right. and all those, those, uh, those chemicals, chemical compounds that work to make you healthy. So, okay, so I hate nearly all vegetables. Yeah, I know. No, 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 but see, so, so here's the deal. I remember, I I, I remember, I remember, I remember when we did the uh, interview with Michelle Obama uh, in her garden. And she was like, Roland, it's fruit, fruits and vegetables. I said, precisely. You said fruits and vegetables. Yes. I said, so if I ain't eating most of these vegetables, but if I'm doing fruit, I said, don't that count? It counts towards something, Roland. Okay, okay, all right. But what did I just say? I said you need uh, a variety of foods because you need all of the okay. nutrients that come from those foods, including vegetables, to help to, to build your health, okay, right? Okay, so let's so I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go over here. All right, so okay. so let's deal with this here. All right, so all right. you got grapes, you got bananas, you got oranges. Yeah. I can't stand red apples. I do green apples. Any apples? Uh, okay, but what do these lemons do? So the lemons were there really for the water. Notice how it's it's next to the okay. water. Okay. But but lemons are anti anti. Um, Infl inflammatory. Okay. Okay, so that's So what do we do with them? What do we, we put it in the water or yeah, what do we do with do, it? Do a couple of slices in your water. It's anti-inflammatory. So it, it helps to cut down inflammation. Got it. Okay, All right. it's also a good source of vitamin C. Okay, value of the oranges. Yeah, Vi good source of vitamin C, lots of fiber. You s why are you... What, no, I'm what, listening. What's your... Yeah. No, I'm listening. Great source of vitamin I'm not, I'm not C. giving you a bad look. I'm listening. Lots of fiber, antioxidants that, that go a long way to protect your health. Oh. And when I say protect your health, I don't mean some nebulous thing. I'm talking about when you eat like this, right. you cut down, you, re, you reduce your, your, your chances of staving off, you, you reduce your chances of getting chronic diseases like heart disease, mm -hmm. like hypertension, like all of these foods work to help you mm -hmm. stave off those chronic diseases. Okay. Hypertension, cancer. Okay, like for example, this bro bro broccoli is uh. a, it's a cruciferous vegetable, which uh. means, which means, but it can go a long way to protect you from cancer. But broccoli. And yeah, broccoli. Exactly. You, do you like cream of broccoli I, I soup? I, hell no. Okay. All right. Not I, even I, that. I hate all broccoli. But you could put hate all broccoli. Don't be a hater, no, Roland. No, no, no. I can't stand broccoli. Okay. So well, there, there's an array, there's an array of green, yellow, orange, all the colors in the rainbow of vegetables <laughs> that could help Again, you. My dad watching. He loved everything you're saying. Wonderful. I, I, yeah, I, and I he can't. also likes beans. If I, 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 if I, oh, don't even get me started. I remember he likes don't beans. Don't even get me started on yeah. damn beans. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm yeah. having P PTSD. Yeah, but the oh beans God. are good, and the beans are really good for your heart. They protect you from heart disease. Oh it's true. Oh my God, but Lord yeah. have mercy. Soluble fiber that will protect you against heart disease. Okay, so yes. we, okay, over there, we got we got broccoli, we got, we got carrots, carrots, we got tomatoes. Okay, I do, I do tomatoes. I'm good with the tomatoes. What's the other stuff? Okay, good, you, but you can't just, you can't stick with one color. The point is, I want you to have all the colors. Okay, so if I have, okay, fine. Okay, so if I got the red, if I got the red for the tomatoes. Yeah. Okay, and I, you get some grapes. I, I, I do cucumbers. Yeah. Okay, I'll do. Green. Okay. okay. Now, when it comes to lettuce, uh, what I've heard, the ice, I, I heard iceberg is a joke. Yeah. Because no, <laughs> yeah. That, that romaine is better. Yes, because the darker the leafy green, cool. the more now, nutrition. Now, now I do romaine. Yeah. That arugula is uh, is awful for me. I can't. Okay. Well, but, but in at least, everything, but in at, everything. But, but, but uh, yes, it is. But at least if I blend it, 
I, I, I can tolerate. Then blend it, brother. I can tolerate. I can tolerate. Then, it. then blend it. Blend it up in the green juice. Okay. Okay. We do can all do that. Of that, right? Okay. Now what's the what's the okay? You got popcorn. So you get, here. Well, so I want because I want you to I want you to eat your snacks. I, because people are going to snack, right? Okay. And it's okay to have healthy snacks anyway throughout the day. Um, you need a little something to tide you over at the two o'clock slump. But, but, ain't, but, 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 but ain't no butter and uh, and salt and other stuff on here. This ain't a movie. This ain't a movie theater popcorn, right? This is no. This is not movie theater. That's my popcorn. point. This is not. But it's. You don't want me to give a brand, but no, no, go ahead. I don't care. Is, it's Skinny Girl. Skinny Girl. It's Skinny Girl. Okay, all it's right. Skinny Girl pop. It's Skinny Popcorn. And what that means is that you have fewer calories per serving. Okay. Right. Three and a quarter cups. Three and a half cups is what a serving actually is of this. Three and a half cups. Yeah, three okay. and a half cups. And you're talking about like under 60 calories. And what we got here? So these are almonds. I hate most nuts. Okay, most nuts. Why are you hating on I just, I just, what I, is I, your deal? I never like, I didn't, I didn't like nuts growing up. I just didn't like nuts. Okay. I, I have, I have. Put those in the smoothie No, 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 too. but Do I have, no, no, but here's what I did. I did, I have forced myself yes. uh, to tolerate pecans Oh. And, 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 and I really tolerate them pecans with a banana. Pecans and a banana. Look, no, however look, you get down. Whatever the hell make me gonna eat it. However okay. you get down, I'm not I'm mad saying. at it. I'm not mad at it as long as you put it in your body, right? Okay, so, and what I want, I want you to know is that when you do, when you do your snacks, make sure that you snack, your snack is not larger than a cl what you can fit in a closed fist. Oh. I don't mean have the nuts all the way out here in the whole palm of your hand. I'm talking about a Close. closed fist. Because this, yeah, just ball your fist so, up. So, okay, so, okay, so that's the case. So if we're talking about our meal, how many times should we be snacking a day? Okay, so, so when we say, what two, maybe twice. Okay. Okay, so because you might have something before between your your morning meal and your and your afternoon meal. Okay. And then you might require one uh, another one. Okay. Your body might require one, or you might choose to have another snack between your your afternoon and your evening meal. <laughs> well, my dad texted okay. me to my quick giving row a hard time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Um, yes, because you always do this. But I, so, I do. Yeah, yeah two, two but, but, but here, but okay, the reason I do, I'm just being honest, but there are a lot of people, okay, who are like that. So again, if you're offering substitutes, yes. like so for instance, I, I, you know, I ain't a fan, like when I have, I have a meal plan, so Terry Starks is like, okay, do a sweet potato. I'm like, Terry, I ain't no damn potato. The sweet potato is good, though. First of all, it helps to hydrate your body. Yeah, One, but see, but I like yams. Rich, I don't like the sweet potato. It, but, but the sweet potato has a lot of antioxidants to, to protect you against cancer again. Sweet potato also is high in fiber, so it helps you to stop. You, you, it will help you to not to eat as much. Does that make sense? But, but the grapes are high in fiber, right? Yeah, but grapes have more sugar than, than sweet potato. So the, we're talking is, about... Okay, is a green apple high in fiber? Yes, it is. Cool. Apples are high in fiber, and they have a so substance. Can, they have, and the substance so is I can called have a green apple instead of sweet potato. I, not instead of a sweet potato. It's not the same. No, sweet potatoes have other vitamins. Vitamin A. They're rich in vitamin A, so they're rich what, in what antioxidants. I need, what I need vitamin A for? To protect you against cancer. Okay, what else? Okay. Is that, is that, that, is that, show, not, that show has every food is item. That, is that not a win? Is that, that not show a win? Every food Dude, item. You know, is that not a win? All right, hold on one second. I gotta go. Uh, uh, say before in the show. Uh, uh, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. All right, here's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna do this here. Uh, we're gonna end, we're gonna end the show. Uh, how far? How much time I got? Uh, I got three minutes to the end of the show. So we're going to continue. Uh, and then we're just going to tape one segment. I'm going to run it tomorrow. And I'm going to have each one of the panelists ask questions. Okay, so Doc, let's come back. I'm just letting y'all know right in the control room. All right, so let's come back. All right, so your deal is you need fruits and vegetables. Yes, you do. Okay, all right. You want a variety of foods. You want fruits. You want vegetables. You want lean meat. You want to eat lean and you want to eat clean. Okay, so look, if we say lean meat, okay, so when I'm in the grocery store and it says, you know, this is... Lean. Not ribs, not ribs, okay? I, now, we're not I, talking... I, I wasn't about to mention oh, ribs. Well, you I'm, know, okay, Texas. I, I'm talking about like when they... But I, but I ain't got a problem with ribs now. I'm through but, Texas. But, 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 ain't no, but, but, but if you eat ribs like, you know, once every six months... Okay, all right. Right, I, I mean, that. I that's my point. That. It ain't like you eating ribs yeah. like and the thing is, once you a just, month. You just... Ex well, but a lot of people eat them once a week. I, I know, I'm, okay. but I'm saying, like, for instance, I don't eat a lot of steak. So I, I, I like, I literally, I'm talking about, it, the, it, it listen, may not even be twice a year. The last time we talked, I told you to limit your red meat to four ounces, which is, an, which is a, a serving, four, no more than four ounces in a week. So, like, 
Oh, no. I, I, yeah, so, I don't, so if most, you're my, having it occasionally, no, no, no. Most, that is the no, goal. No, no, most of my, I mean, typically for me, it typically, it's, it's, it's chicken, it's fish. Yes. Uh, it might be ground turkey, it might, okay. be, but might be ground beef. Not a lot, but again, it's, but it's, but it's rare. All right, so let me do this here, folks. Uh, how can folks reach you? GetDrRoe.com. DrRoe.com. Get GetDrRoe.com. That's the domain. GetDrRoe.com. Okay, GetDrRoe.com. Go there, get my book. My new So not everything Roe.com. Get, get DrRoe.com. Get DrRoe.com. Y'all, go, go to the website, get more information. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end the show right now. We're going to shoot an additional segment with Dr. Rowe, and we're going to air on tomorrow's show because uh, my pound looks real hungry. Uh, and we know skinny-ass Jason, he got some questions. Uh, you need to bulk him up. He's like 180 pounds. Jason Jason needs, Jason bony as hell. Don't hate on so, Jason. No, but Jason bony as hell. Uh, and so he, he need to bulk the hell up. So I'm, I'm going to have a question for Jason, how to bulk his ass up. All right, y'all. I'm going to see y'all tomorrow right here at Roland Martin Unfiltered. Yeah, you, I told y'all United just destroyed my suitcase. I was going to rock this at yesterday speech in Wichita and Arnold Dr. King. But of course, I have not worn an ascot uh, in a while, a bunch of y'all been saying. So this, this is the first time I've even wore an ascot on the show. So I went ahead uh, and did it. Yeah, United is paying for a new bag and paying for some other stuff after they destroyed my suitcase. And so uh, that's why I'm rocking. So uh, I might rock one tomorrow. I'm going to see y'all tomorrow right here on Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. How? A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> we support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network.